there we go. So today we're talking about eye anatomy, and this is an important concept because it, if you don't know anatomy, you simply cannot do iridology well. Knowing markings is not what this is all about, right? Totally not, not at all. And so this is so important that we get to know uh, the anatomy of the eye. So let's get this going here. And just a little announcement that we are gonna start doing these lives regularly again. And I took a couple months off for a family thing that needed my attention, but things are settled and this is good. And so we are going to now be doing these every Wednesday and every Friday, probably 11 a.m. And so love to have you join us for that. Hi Virgie, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Let's start with learning a little bit of really basic stuff about the eyes. And this first piece is, did you know your pupils are not actually centered? And for those of you on Instagram, I know the video's not that fabulous. It doesn't come across super great. But when we look at an eye and we look at it up close, what we see, oh my goodness, that was not supposed to happen. What we see, just it's a tech struggle day to day. There we go. What we see is this that the pupil is not centered. Did you know that before, that the pupil is actually not centered? The side of the iris that is closest to the nose will always be narrower. And so if we see that the narrower side is on the right, to the right of the pupil, we know that it is a right iris. If we see that the narrower side is to the left of the pupil, we know it is a left iris. So that's your first thing that you need to know as we are looking at iridology. It is just super important that we get these little basics down. Why do you need to know that? Well, you might actually be working um, from iris photos where enough of the markers, enough of the face has been cut off that you can't see things like the inner canthus or the outer canthus or you know, the nose or anything like that. And so if you know that the pupil is not dead center, that it's off centered and that area, the part of the iris that is closest to the nose is always the narrower side of the iris, you will always know whether you're looking at a right eye or a left eye. So that's the first thing we need to know when we're talking about the anatomy of the eye. And then we want to get a little more granular and actually look at the eye. So when we look at a picture of the eyeball like this, what we know is that the eye is actually a, the largest nerve receptor in your body, right? The largest nerve receptor. It is the very end of the optic nerve. And as such, it is um, very unique. It's also the only nerve receptor that is totally full of fluid. Right? So when we look at the eye, we've got two chambers in the eye that uh, hold fluid. The first one is the anterior chamber, which is right here. And the second one is the posterior chamber, which, which is right here. These two chambers are, are separated by the iris and the lens. The pupil is right here, and this is actually a hole. Right? It's actually just a hole, but its size is regulated by the iris, which is very, very interesting. Um, when we look at the entire eyeball as a whole, it is encased in a very tough sheath. That sheath is called, well, at the front, it's called the, the cornea and the rest of it where it's white is called the sclera. So the sclera is white. Hi, Nam Fan, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And at the front, of course, this tough membrane is clear because if it was white, we wouldn't be able to see. We also know that the optic nerve exits the back of the eye and it actually splits into two separate pathways. And it's the fact that it does split that actually gives us binocular vision. So what this means is that I'm going to flip my camera around here. So hi, Instagram. So Instagram can see me better. So you've got, if you're looking at your right eye, 
you've got one nerve pathway that goes straight back and another one that crosses over to the left side of the brain. So what does that mean? It means that in the middle, so you've got one going straight back on each side and one coming across like this, where they cross is called the optic chiasm. And that again is what gives us binocular vision. It gives us field of depth. So if you ever had to wear an eye patch like that, you'll find that you lose your depth perception, right? We need that nerve pathway to split into two for us to actually be able to see what see properly the way humans are supposed to be seeing. When we look at the eye sideways, so you'll recognize this is that same image we looked at before, but we've just flipped it on its side and gotten rid of the back. Now we are going to uh, be looking specifically at this part of the eye right here. This part right here. We're going to look at this in a black and white pencil drawing diagram because on this image, it looks like it's really simple, like there's not much there. But when we look at this in detail, there is a lot going on in this tiny little area. So, you ready? This is going to be the highlights tour. When we look at the iris, so this is one side of the iris, the pupil is sitting right over here. Pupil is sitting right here. So this is one side, a cross section of one side of the iris. The most important thing, oops, my camera stand is wanting to sag, there we go. Um, the very first thing we want to be aware of is the anterior border layer, which is right here. I'll move my picture of my face, there we go. The anterior border layer is right here. This is the front facing side of the eye. This is what the world sees. And the anterior border layer actually has one layer in front of it and that would be the cornea. So we've got the cornea in front of it, which is not a part of the iris. Then we have the anterior border layer, which is a part of the iris. And it is this anterior border layer that holds the pigment. So if you have blue eyes you, and they have no other colors in them, you have very little pigment there. If you have hazel eyes or mixed eyes, you'll have more pigment sitting in there. If you have brown eyes, you'll have a lot of pigment sitting in here. And you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here as well. And um, this is important to know because this is collectively what we call the stroma. Collectively what we call the stroma. And this stroma contains blood vessels and nerves and individual fibers that radiate outwards and muscles. This stroma, even though it is very, very, very thin, did I use enough berries right there? Has a lot of stuff in it. Now we also have the posterior epithelium, which is the very back of the iris. Now, how many of you, I'd like to see a show of hands. Hi, Jimmy Glue, good to see you. Um, how many of you have actually done an eye dissection, maybe a cow eye or a sheep eye in high school biology? I did them in junior high and high school. And um, junior high is what I think you call in the state's middle school. I could be wrong. At any rate, um, we did them in junior high and in high school. And I was impressed with two things. Number one, how tough the, the sclera is really is. It is really, really hard. Either that or they gave us really, really dull scalpels because they were afraid that teenagers would be reckless at any rate. But they also, I also was impressed with the fact that this posterior epithelium is very, very thin and it truly is only two layers thick, just like you see here. And it is dark brown or black. Now, what we have inside of that, so this is kind of, someone described this as an apple pie. We've got the anterior border layer, which is the top crust. We've got the posterior epithelium, which is the bottom crust. We've got all this other stuff in the middle, which is the filling. And some important pieces in here Right here, we have the dilator muscle. Some people also call this the posterior membrane. This is the muscle that makes your pupil open up and get bigger, right? Here, we have the sphincter muscle. And the sphincter muscle is the muscle that constricts the pupil and makes it get smaller. So these are some of the most important 
pieces, parts of this iris tissue of the stroma. When we look at an iris, I'm going to move my camera much closer for my Instagram friends. When we come uh, and we look at an iris up close, we're going to see that there are shadings in there. So for those of you on Instagram, back to the black and white drawing, and those of you who are with me on Facebook or on the webinar, you can see that, oh, I did not mean to do that. There we go. You can see that we're showing different layers here, different depths, sort of grooves that go down and in. The deeper the groove, the darker the shading. All right, so when we look at this beautiful, lovely uh, blue iris, we can see that there are little areas that have darker patches in them. So with this, we are looking down through the depths of the fibers, right? With this lovely mixed eye, we also have some shading. We can see that there's a little bit of shading in some of these areas, a little patch of where it's a little bit grayer here. So again, fibers are separated. We are looking deeper into the iris. Here, even in, in these lines that radiate outwards, we can see that there's more shading. This is not the same as what we're looking at here, but we're looking at these bits of shading and they, again, it just tells us how deep we're looking into the iris. Now, some fibers look like they're sitting right on top of the iris. So we've got this one here that looks like it was laid on top. We've got some over here that look like they are, well, they are, if they're sitting way on top, right? They're up high on the surface. We also have things that look like they might be a little bit deeper. So when we look at this iris, we see these wrinkles. These are actually wrinkles in the surface of the eye. And they, and we've got them up here too. And they really are a crinkle where the surface of the eye comes across, goes down, comes up and comes across again. And that is known as a contraction furrow, like what we see on the diagram right here. Okay, so what we need to remember is that in an eye like this one at the bottom, where we see all of this white coming around here, this is actually in the cornea. This isn't in the iris at all. And what that means is that uh, we need to understand, again, the anatomy of the eye to understand that this is not an iris sign. It's a cornea sign. Otherwise, you might be tempted to, I don't know, give it some strange interpretation that really doesn't exist. So remember when we looked back at that, at this diagram when we had it blown up really large? Well, we're going to look at this in a slightly different way now, because what we see here is what those muscles actually look like. So on this, we have the dilator muscle and its fibers radiate outwards. We have the sphincter muscle, its fibers go around and around and around. So let's talk about what this really means and why this works. I'm just popping my phone back onto its stand so that I can see my, have, have my hands here. All right, so we've got, we've got these, this dilator muscle that is anchored in to the sclera and it's anchored in to the edge of the sphincter muscle. So when these dilator muscle fibers, which are lined up like this, contract, they slide in and this gets shorter, so it gets narrower, and it pulls on this edge, pull, 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 and that, that um, makes the pupil get bigger. That lets in more light. When we are in a bright room or in a situation where the pupil needs to get smaller, these sphincter muscles, which are also anchored in right here, at this edge between the two muscles. These sphincter muscles go around and around and around. And so when they ratchet shut, they do this. 
and they get shorter and that closes down the pupil, but it also pulls on the edge of the end of the dilator muscle and stretches the dilator muscle out again to make this part of the iris wider again. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? And if you're, you know, I'm watching Facebook and I'm watching Instagram. And so if that makes sense, give me a thumbs up. We know that, hi, Lua, Crystal, it's good to see you. We know that the iris itself, aside from having nerves that feed these muscles that regulate the, the size of the pupil, we know that the iris contains 28,000 other nerve endings. And we don't even know what they do. Right, we haven't figured that out yet, but that's okay. That's okay. Maybe it'll come. Now, in this eye, and I'm going to bring my camera closer again for my Instagram friends. Those of you who are with me on Facebook, you have decent pictures. Anyway, so when we look at an iris photo, you can see that right here, there's a change in texture coming all the way around. So we've got this area right here. And then we've got this out here. The edge of this is actually the edge. This is that sphincter muscle. This is the sphincter muscle. We should not see it this clearly. When we see it this clearly, we know that there is likely a, labor of, a layer of fiber that did not get laid down in the eye. And when we have a layer of fiber, when the fiber is thin as far as how many layers, we know that, um, we know that there is going to be less resiliency in the corresponding body part, right? And so again, when we look at the iris and we look at it in a black and white drawing to look at these fibers, what we see is we have the fibers from the outer edge of the iris. Now, did you notice back here, we have this ring coming around here. That's going to be important in just a moment, so lock that into your memory. That is the same as this, coming right around here. So the fibers in the eye, these threads that we see up here, and the threads that we see down here, come in at the outer edge of the iris, towards that inner ring, then they do a hairpin turn and go back out to the edge of the iris. In the inner, inside that ring, inside that ring, they do sort of the mirror image, right? They start at the inner edge of the iris. So they're starting at the pupil's edge. They come up to that ring, do a hairpin turn and come back to that iris edge. And so what we know here is that these fibers are not just threads. They're not like a strand of hair. They are actually very fine capillaries. Well, capillaries are fine. That was an oxymoron. Sorry about that. Um, but they are capillaries. And the reason they appear white is because they have a collagen coating on them. And again, we know that the blood flow from the limbus towards the collarette is arterial, so it's oxygen rich. We know that the blood flow going back towards the limbus is venous, so it's oxygen poor. And the same holds true in this area of the eye, that the blood flow towards the collarette is oxygen rich. It's arterial flow. The blood flow back to the, the edge of the pupil is venous. It's oxygen poor. Your iris needs oxygenation just like every other part of your body does. We know that the iris is the focus of iridology, right? And we know that constitutional iridology studies the patterns of the fiber, the fiber structure, the base color, surface pigment, and we use all of those to assess inherited predispositions. So when we look at an eye, we can't say this person has that specific problem, but we can ask questions about a personal or family history of problems in a certain area. A constitutional iridologist never, ever, ever does an analysis without background information because we don't know what the client is doing for their health. You might have a client who's doing all the right things. Their eyes, your first impression of their eyes might be that they are a one hot mass, 
right? But they're doing so many things that are right for their health that they are helping their body to function really well. And so you can't diagnose a problem. This isn't a party game. Too many people treat it as a party game. We really do need to have a conversation with our client. Now, I was at the bank a week or two ago um, working with a new account manager on some things. And um, she looked at my business card and said, Ira Dolla. She, she asked, what is that? And I said, I look at the eyes and I help people understand why their health is the way it is. She instantly popped off her glasses, leaned across the desk and said, what do you see? What do you see? And, and I said, well, nothing because I don't have any equipment here. The lighting is poor and I know nothing about you. And she kind of went, oh, and I said, yeah, it's, it's so much deeper than just look at the eyes and tell the person what's wrong. Doesn't work like that. So let's do a little bit of a, an analysis here. Let's do a case study. So this is a client of mine. And when she first came to me, these, we took these pictures and she was in her mid thirties. And you can, I think you can maybe even, no, I think you're fine. Okay, never mind. That was a little train wreck in my brain. Mid thirties, she was having problems getting pregnant. She'd been trying for a couple of years and they had conceived once and had a miscarriage. As we look at this, I want you to look for the layers that you see. Can you see all of the areas that have shading in them, which suggests that we are looking into the depths of the iris? Yeah, so as we look at this, hi yoga girl, good to see you there. So we see that there's many layers. We see there's even shading just inside this collarette. Right? We've got lots of areas of shading here. Some of the fibers, including the cholera, actually look like it's laid on top of the eye. And you might see that even more clearly in this image where we just expanded the, the picture. So as we look at this, we need to remember that the eyes suggest there may be personal or family history tendencies of things. And with this client in particular, as I looked at her eyes, my first impression because of one or two little things that I saw was that she maybe was at risk for the MTHFR defect, which is a genetic thing that is certainly passed down. And women who have the MTHR defect have a much harder time conceiving and staying pregnant. So when I saw that, I knew we were going to have to do some work with her on this. There's a slight cloudiness. Oh, I did not mean to do that. There's a slight cloudiness also over this outer bit of the iris right in here. Now that may not show up well on Instagram. Hopefully you can see it well, um, as I pointed out over here, this slight cloudiness. And this suggests that there might be a personal history, personal situation right now of her, her liver enzymes not being quite right and messing up her carbohydrate metabolism. Now that would, potentially suggest some issues that could lead to fertility problems as well. So I asked her about her carbohydrate cravings and she said, yep. And we suggested that she start cleaning that up. Now, what you need to remember when we're doing iridology is that you do your clients a tremendous disservice to talk about every single little marker you see in their eyes. All right. The only way I can, the only thing I can pair that to is like vomiting all over them right? It's too much information that this client came in about fertility. So I kept my analysis focused on anything that could impact fertility. That was so, so important. And so that's all we focused on was things that I saw that could inform me about why her body was resisting getting pregnant. So this is it's an important concept that so many iridologists don't get. So when we look at this, what we did is we actually worked with the MTHFR. We worked with her blood sugars um, because truly her blood sugars were unbalanced and that's part of the liver thing, part of the, the stuff that's going on up here, the carbohydrate issue. And she actually did conceive, which was pretty exciting. And once she'd conceived, she decided she didn't need me anymore and then she's lost touch with me and that's okay. Her journey, not mine. So with this information, 
do you want to learn more iridology? Yeah? If you do, give me a thumbs up. I don't care what platform you're on, give me a thumbs up if you want to learn more iridology or leave me a comment, better off, just leave me a comment and just put more please in the comments. And the reason I'm asking this is because we have coming up soon another go round, another session. Hi, one me. Good to see you. We have another session of Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridologist starting soon. Now, you didn't come here for an infomercial today, so I'm not going to spend 30 minutes giving you all the details. However, this is, I'm, I'm going to spend about a minute and a half if that's okay with you. Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is the only live, online, fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care. So they can stop working unpaid overtime. How many of you do iridology now or do nutrition or herbal kinds of consultations? And how many of you spend your own time after hours unpaid creating client protocols? Yeah? Yeah, if you do, I wanna see that in the comments because that's what I see a lot of people doing. And those programs are usually overwhelming for their clients. And so I teach you in the context of using iridology, how to create programs right in your client sessions that will not overwhelm your clients, that your clients will be able to stick with so that you increase client compliance, you increase their success, and you generally increase long-term retention. If you have been hanging out with me for a while, and I know some of you have been, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, finally at last, it's starting again, I've been waiting for this, you can actually hop on over to iridology.education slash, it's a long URL, iridology-certification-level1-1-2. Dash level dash one dash two. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna pop that into the comments boxes wherever I can. There we go. And I don't know how to put that into Instagram. This course starts on Thursday, July 30th. It will be running from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. This course contains all of the information, all of the curriculum you need to certify with the International Iridology Practitioners Association if that is your goal. If you think I need to know a little bit more about iridology before I go investing in a course, totally get it, totally get it. We will be doing an info webinar about the course on Tuesday, July 21st at 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Everything is mountain time because that's my time zone. And you can register for this one at bit.ly slash iridology dash biz dash webinar. This is where you're going to learn um, really how iridology can help you in your nutrition or herbal or naturopathic business. Alrighty. So with that, my friends, whoops, forgot to hit enter there. There we go. With that, I would love it if you would just uh, stay in touch with me, uh, engage with me on social media. Let me know what your questions are about iridology. Let me know what you'd like to learn in these little free sessions that we do. And with that, I'm going to say that's it for now. Have a great day and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.